So one of the exciting things about Richard being late is that he's just here from uh, from France, where he was at the the if IFLA meeting, right? With the, and you were doing the whole load man thing over there. Too. Yeah, there was a link data thing at, at IFLA in Lyon, but the important thing was there was a link data in library satellite meeting run by the National Library of France in Paris last Thursday, which was an excellent day. So give, can you give a two-minute summary of, of that and what, what that was about? Well, it's it an interesting thing because they, they, um, they weren't aiming it at a room full of link data geeks, which was a nice change. Yeah. Um, they, they actually had a, a workshop in the afternoon for managers. Um, and a uh, colleague of mine, Ted Fonds from OCLC, did an introduction workshop on the morning as well. And I think the, uh, the best quote from that was from a, a library manager. I think she ran the National Library of Luxembourg, I think. Yeah. But don't quote me on that. Uh, and she was about to ask a question. She says, but I must say, we've been doing link data for two years. And today, I now know what a triple is. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and, you know, there, there was a lot of high level, how do you introduce it to your library, uh, how do you motivate the staff, how do you stop um, catalogers running for the hills, all those kind of things, yeah. uh, which was a really interesting section. Um, I, I, my main focus was I sat on a panel at the end, um, which was aimed at people who build library systems. So there was the guy who's done the software for data.bnf.fr. Have a look at that. They've done, they understand link data. They've done it properly. Mm. Uh, there was me, and then there's a guy called uh, Slomo Sanders from Ex Libris, who's doing their link data imp implementation internally. Mm. And as one tweeter put it, singularity. We have OCLC <laughs> and Ex Libris on the same panel. But that's an in joke. So it was a really good day. There was about 100 people there. Lots of talk at all sorts of levels. So that's great. It went really well. So. I was there, and I should have been here last night, but thanks to Lufthansa and a thunderstorm, I wasn't. Um, I, I'm only just here, and I haven't slept for a while, but never mind. <laughs> if, if I doze off halfway through, it <laughs> chuck something at me. So, what I was on the programme for was this. Oh yes, yes, I did this a couple of days ago. Um, um, some of these slides might be a shock to me, so... <laughs> we'll, we'll see. So I'm here to talk about WorldCat, Works, and Schema.org. An, an interesting collection of stuff. So just, just to put it in context, let's run through what these are. WorldCat, um, the open data interface to the OCLC collected works managed and curated by oh God, tens of thousands of libraries around the world, plus lots of partners, uh, serial aggregators, uh, publishers, etc., etc. At the moment, it's got just over 322 million bibliographic uh, records in there in 485 languages uh, as it says corporately managed by thousands of libraries and has had linked data in it since 2012 it was our first experiment uh, with links in there to authoritative hubs like uh, VFAS, Library of Congress, Subject Headings and Name Authorities, Dewey uh, we initially did it in RDFA uh, and then extended it with uh, content negotiation to give all our favourite flavours of linked data. Uh, pick your favourite, uh, which isn't mine, but that's beside the point. Uh, and it was schema.org based. Uh, I mean, this was schema.org at a year old, so it was uh, still lacking in one or two bibliographic things, and we, we, we had a go at extending it, I think is the best description of it. We've learned since then and changed it a bit, which you'll find out today. So that's WorldCat. WorldCat Works. WorldCat Works is the first bibliographic entity that OCLC have released. Uh, and it came out in April this year. Um, it, it's one of several entities. Uh, as it says there, there was 197 million, million of them uh, published in April. They were data mined from WorldCat data and other linked data resources. This isn't a Oh look, I've got a mark record, I'll work out what work it is and, and slap it out there. This is, this is a really heavyweight data mining exercise. I think it keeps a small corner of Ohio warm most of the time with all this processing that's going on there. Based on um, Ferber, um, does everybody know what Ferber is? Yeah, good, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Um, 
Uh, the the, the uh, functional representation of Naomi Bright's got it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think I left that bit of knowledge back in Europe. Um, so uh, a lot of algorithm work that's, that's over 10 years old now that we've been building up through, um, through uh, mining the WorldCat data. Uh, it, these works have got canonical work identifiers, uh, URIs. Uh, so in effect, this set of data could be treated as uh, an authority file for works. They are persistent identifiers for the individual works. Uh, and they set the context for these works in a network of um, authority <coughs> hubs. So the VAFs, the, um, the Library of Congress, etc., etc. It's the first of several upcoming WorldCat entities, person, place, organisation, etc. We'll find out more about that later on. Uh, and it's based again on schema.org link data in all the favourite flavours, including RDFA. Schema.org itself, I don't know why I'm telling you about this, the man that could tell you all about it is sat at the back, but never mind, I've got some slides. Um, backed by major search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, and Yandex, um, uh, launched in 2011, a broad vocabulary for the web, basically structured markup to place in web pages in microdata or RDFA and now um, JSON um, to describe stuff on the web, most things on the web. Uh, and it's banded about approximately 15% of the web, i.e. millions of sites are already using this. So those are the topics I'm going to cover. Let's, let's dive into uh, WorldCat. Um, Anybody never been here? Good. So, WorldCat, searching WorldCat, scroll to the bottom, open the link data tab, uh, and there is a URI for what a librarian would call you a manifestation. It's, it's a book with an ISBN and assorted other stuff with it. Um, it's in our DFA in this page. This is the format that we started with a couple of years ago, and it is the format today. It will change slightly in the near future, but not very much. Of course, RDFA, you don't really have to see it. It's embedded in the HTML in the page. But because this was an experimental process, we wanted people to not only be able to scrape the RDFA out of the page, people like Google, etc., uh, but we wanted to show it, show it to people so they can get an understanding. Uh, as I said earlier, we, um, we um, did content negotiation, so you can get at the raw code here. It's a, a curl command to get link data JSON from that <coughs> page, in effect, or the service behind it. Um, if you like JSON, and you can read it on the fly. Um, I did have all of this record displayed, but PowerPoint wouldn't scroll it. Mm -hmm. So I took the two thirds out in the middle, but that's, that's JSON LD for you. Um, we can equally get at it using Turtle, which tends to be my favourite um, dialect of, of, of RDF um, in, in a link data context. So you can see that uh, most of the features you would expect to find in a, in a, in a library catalogue are here. Most of the terms are schema.org ones. There's there's a couple of something called libraries of vocabulary, and that was our early struggle of um, it's not in schema.org, what have you used? But the vast majority of this is in schema.org and therefore recognisable by the search engines and harvested at re regular intervals, as our processor will attest at regular periods. Here is a, a link here for something called example of work. Um, Example of work, when we put it in here, was not a schema.org property. It, uh, but you can do that. You can assert your own terms for schema.org. Search engines won't recognise them, but you can assert your own terms. I'm happy to say that that is now in schema.org as of, was it yesterday? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, round about yesterday. I, I ask because I don't know what day it is either. Anyway, <laughs> this is a sort of work link takes you through to something with the work ID. So this is the uh, call to go get the uh, canonical work that describes um, this 
particular word. Yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble getting the words in the right order here, but never mind. <laughs> um, this, you know, e even in turtle is a bit uh, messy because of all the subject relationships in it. So what you can do is the works data has got uh, a viewer on the front end of it. This is what's got the RDFA data in there. Um, this is uh, designed for people just exploring the data. This isn't a library patron, patron's view of, of the library data. Um, so lurking at the top is the identifier. And by opening up all these tabs, you can see the hell of a lot of links in this data. There's not a lot of text. There's a few descriptions. There's a few uh, work names there. But the rest of it is all links. Surprise, surprise, because it's linked data. There's very little that's textual in this environment. And ideally, when we finish cleaning these up, because we've released them for comment, we know we want to make some enhancements. We didn't make decisions about what we should leave out. So you'll find things with very similar looking titles up there, some language labels, some not language labels. But the, the key set of links are these here, which you've got work example relationships. So this is the work giving you pointers down to the manifestations, the OCLC numbered manifestations. OCLC number is a bit of a messy approach to a manifestation. It's not a perfect manifestation representation, but it'll do for now. It's close enough. And as we re refine things over time, uh, they will get better. Um, so let's move on a little bit further. Schema uh, Org, as I say, around since 2011, backed by um, uh, the four major search engines. Uh, and as I said, based on stuff, so we've got creative works, book, movie, music recording, recipe, etc. We've got events, we've got health and medical types, organisation, person, place, local businesses, products. So this is all your commercial. Um, I'll offer to sell you this, or if you're a library, I'll offer to lend you this for a price for a period and that kind of thing. Reviews, aggregate ratings, actions, which is when you're going to be able to do various things. It does most things on the web. Most sectors have got a, a, a toe in here. But um, as you saw when I showed you the WorldCat data in the first place, we didn't think it, well, I didn't think it covered the bibliographic world well enough. And a lot of people agreed with me. So I set up a W3C community group with the wonderful name of the Schema Bib Extend community group. The idea of this was to get a group of organisations and people interested in bibliographic data and describing it on the web so people could find it. So this isn't a cataloguing standards body. This is uh, we want people to find our resources. Those people are usually in a search engine somewhere. We want to be able to tell that world what resources we have. And we've come to the conclusion that vocabulary was a, a little bit lightweight in that area. Um, and I think um, Dan would agree it was a little bit lightweight in that area at the time. So I was quite surprised very rapidly this grew to a, a group of 80 people started about two years ago. Uh, and we had great fun on um, telephone conversations discussing the innards of library data, which is, mm, yes. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Should we be adopting further? Should we be recognising further? Why haven't we got a label in schema.org that represents my favourite mark tag in the 700s or the 500s or the 800s? And, oh, it was great fun. <laughs> A bit analogous to herding cats, I think, being chair of that group. But what we discovered after quite a period of looking at this was the traditional approach of saying, OK, I've got all my library data in a standard called MARC or RDA or whatever. How do I convert that into schema.org? And the moment you start to do that, you end up with a, a list probably longer than the list of attributes of MARC that are missing from schema.org. You just don't get anywhere. So we tried a different approach. So what we did was say, forget we even had library standards for a moment. I know it's difficult, but forget we even had them. Say, so, okay, I've got a book. 
I've got an electronic article, I've got a thesis or whatever. How would I describe them using schema.org as it was constituted at the time? And then have a look at what's missing. And then we'll talk about how we describe those. And it's surprising how well we did. Um, uh, books and, uh, and things like that were, were fairly easy to do. We attempted library holdings. And we all we kind of put library holdings off for about six months before we even looked at it, because this is going to be complicated. Uh, we, we're going to have to create a class that will represent a library holding, etc., etc. But surprisingly enough, especially with the help from a guy called Dan Scott, is Dan Scott here this week? He's not. Uh, Laurentian University, very active on the Code for Live community, uh, open source library systems, COA, Evergreen, Voofy, and things like that. A bit of work from him. He managed to do library holdings description as you would put it on your library search interface without inventing a single new property. He managed to do it all using Offer and one or two other things in, in the library book. We lobbied for a bit of change in wording to make Offer look a little bit more lender friendly as against um, trying to sell his stuff friendly. Uh, so there was a lot of those kind of things that went on. Uh, we, we looked at uh, periodicals, articles, um, journal issues, that kind of stuff, and there was there's definitely a gap there, and we made some proposals in that area. And, and it was also light on the relationships between creative works. So in, in the library world, we're very happy about work expression, manifestation, item. And there was nothing that approached it at all in Schemadol. So that's where those two properties, creative, uh, work example and example of work came from. Fairly lightweight relationships between things, but gave you the ability to recognise those sorts of relationships. So, a bit of stop press, and neither Dan at the back or me can work out whether it was yesterday or today or not because of the time. It was yesterday. It was yesterday, right, you've checked, haven't you? And I, I guessed it. So the latest release of schema.org, which is version 1.9, includes significant extensions from the schema of all group. So there was periodicals, which introduced um, sort of three new classes. Periodical itself, which could underpin a journal. It could underpin, theoretically, a comic, but they need to do some more work. It could under, underpin a blog or a newspaper, all sorts of things. Then, <coughs> specifically for the journal world, publication issue, publication volume, and then useful properties like start page, end page, and pagination. It's also, uh, in this release and the one before, put in is part of and has part. Uh, so that gives us the ability for multi-volume works, uh, quite possibly bibliographic series, all sorts of things like that, loose collections of things, etc. And then the creative work relationships, for example, of work and work in time. So that has made a massive leap forward in being able to represent the resources in libraries. Now, I've been talking about libraries all the time here, but I'm not forgetting the AM in the uh, love land. A lot of this stuff is generic. A lot, a lot of this stuff is there to be used by other creative work examples. Most of it has happened on creative work. So uh, a movie is a creative work. A book's a creative work. Uh, a newspaper is a creative work. I can't think of any more at the moment. But it, it adds value to the whole arena and we're, uh, a lot of work went on to make sure that some of the relationships and properties we're using made sense in TV and radio. So the, the episode of a season in a series and that kind of stuff was, was in there as well. So, enough about the linked uh, data things that are going on. The question I often ask in groups like this, because people are enthusiastic about linked data, I want to find out about its greatest thing since life's bread, it's going to solve every problem we've ever had. Why are we doing it? And I think it's kind of analogous to this question. Why do libraries catalogue? Well, so people can find their stuff. So why should we adopt linked open data? Linked data as well. It's so people can find our stuff. Because the people are not in the catalogue drawers anymore. They're not in the library interface anymore. They open up their iPad, type in a search, and they're in Mountain View. They're, they're in Yandex's search pages. So 
our resources in, in, in our communities, big generalisation, but it's not far off the truth, are not visible in those environments. And they're not visible in those environments because the search engines don't recognise our data. I mean, I'm sure there's enough staff at Google, they could sit down and they could uh, understand Mark and they could sit down and do other things. They've got lots of other things to do, though, in a bigger world. And they're much happier if everybody talks to them in a consistent way. They don't like specials. So, linked data is a technology. Standard on the web, RDF, URIs, lots of vocabularies. I'm sure you've heard all sorts of things about that. It's there for identifying and linking resources on the web. That's its main purpose. It's an important and powerful enabling technology. That's why we're here. That's why it's important. That's why it's great. It's going to gain traction. But it's only a technology. And I'm finding a lot of people in the library community um, are going, I don't understand it like the lady from the National Library of Luxembourg. I found out what a triple is. She's been using it for two years. <laughs> it's for the system people to worry about. It's the people who make the systems, the people who run the systems. It's not, you know, catalogers shouldn't be worrying about linked data. It might make their life a lot happier. But the actual technicalities of what the hell a triple is and which vocabulary we're using under the hip to describe this stuff shouldn't be a concern of this. You know, how many catalogers learn XML net? It's, it's a technology. It's all part of the infrastructure. It's a very important one, an exceedingly important one. So the real benefits flow from what I would describe an entity-based data architecture where people are describing works and manifestations and people and places and organisations and events from their data and drawing the relationships between them so that somebody that's describing things in the library can really concentrate on a person to make sure they've got that person right. And then any benefit that they add to that person naturally cascades out to the works that are linked to it or the subjects that they write upon, etc. It's all powered by linked data. I'm not, I'm not you know, trying to tone down how wonderful linked data is. I've been evangelising it for too many years. <laughs> so what's happening with entity-based data out on the world? Because we haven't invented this in our community. Well, one of the obvious things that you see as a symptom as entity-based data are leads. Knowledge cards, knowledge graphs. This is things for Mount Everest. So you've got the concept of the thing, the entity, Mount Everest, and then you've got the relationships uh, between mountain ranges, people, and things. Google's equivalent, they seem to be more worried about uh, photographs associated with it. But it's, it's, that, it's all relationship stuff. These are all individual entities that are related to Mount Everest. Of course, it kind of started back in Wikipedia with the fact panel on the right hand side of the Wikipedia page. But they're all basically doing the same thing. And this is what got christened knowledge graphs. For people who are not in the know, it's a bit of a strange term, but hey, it's the one that's stuck. So these are what Google and, and the others would call a knowledge graph. Actually, I would call it the symptom of a knowledge graph, because this is where it's surfacing in a way that humans can handle. I'm curious about that. To what degree do you think that those sorts of things are being created from linked data and not just like, okay, well, I'm just going to call um, uh, Wikipedia and, and, and pull out a few, few things from there and, and make a pool of magic. It's the foundation it's built on, especially uh, at Google, Saturday never having worked for Google, but Freebase was, was the core of this. Yes, they, they work with the, um, the search logs, etc., etc., as well, but they're also pulling in all this schema and all data. Now, what exactly they do with it. I see, I see some symptoms like, it's a really, really weird symptom. Who uses Google Alerts so that when a topic's mentioned, they send you an email? I've got one for OCLC. And all of a sudden, about six months ago, I started getting alerts that this work is about this topic. And it showed me the triples, which I thought was most better. They, they're using it. They obviously need to refine it, etc. So the symptoms are happening. Also, uh, I do believe the press release they made about their latest search algorithm, which is Hummingbird, which they dropped in 
and then told people about it six months ago afterwards. Uh, and that, they say, uses a lot of this knowledge graph stuff. I, I can't, you know, I'm assuming these things, but I think they're fairly educated guesses. Dan's dying to decide whether to say something or not. Hearing my colleagues, uh, colleagues, stuff out of the room for a moment. We do a lot of stuff with triples. We do a lot of stuff with graph data. We don't do so much with, I guess, the more RDF-ish end of the W3C things. But you could call what we do with RDF for RDF clients. Uh, so the schema of is really the, the core of our website. Then. We're stuck in triples from the web. Maybe not triple. Maybe not. Blink data on the effects as well. It's, it's this kind of stuff for sure. So, friendly and advanced to base data on the web, absolutely. Great, okay. thank you. Beyond that, I right, I need, mm -hmm. I, I need to move on or I'll be later than my plane. Uh, <laughs> but you're also seeing symptoms of this where they're using this in other ways. Yet another buzzword that doesn't seem to fit the task, but it will do. It's called semantic search. I mean, search engine land, the blog to follow if you're interested. You get sold to as well a lot on here. But if you're following SEO and that kind of stuff. But they're talking about you know, more engaging, more interactive, more predictive, uh, extracting entities using semantic technologies to help um, unlock what people are looking for. And this isn't just Google. Here they're saying it's the same thing that's going on behind Siri and they say, you know, Apple's going to rule the world in it. Well, I have to say something great. And it's, it's been around so long, there's a book on it. <laughs> and that's, this is what I would call the two halves of what's going on. There's the knowledge graph, the, or sometimes called knowledge cards by some people, showing you, if you like, the peaks of the mountains from under there. And then it's driving this more intuitive searching. Of course, is this beneficial for libraries? Well, the National Library of Thanks with their data.bnf.fr site recognise this. They put this up about two years ago. Total re-engineer semantic uh, system underneath. Um, and uh, what was their return on their investment? More than 80% of their hits come directly from the search engines. Almost exclusively Google. But, so their, their resources have been becoming visible on the web. And they didn't even use Schemadol at that stage. They're, they're introducing it slowly now. But by describing those entities on the web in the way the search engines can find them, um, enable this, this, this benefit. And they were running this um, satellite meeting last Thursday. And some of the stuff they were talking about getting you know, returns on the librarians were. Uh, yes, Dan. I was just here to interrupt and slow down your talk. Sorry. I, I think part of this. Is they're making better websites because they're thinking about the underlying content, what kind of entities, what kind of relationships. There's a great paper from the BBC on this. Yeah. Don't assume that sticking IDF stuff in your website is a signal to the search engine so they're ranking higher. No. But the analysis of doing the link data thinking help them make a better yeah. site. Yeah, identify your entities and give them some identity so they can be found. I mean, there's a lot of systems that you can bookmark a page, come back 10 minutes later, and it'll say session expired. I mean, that's a load of use. It doesn't get anybody in. So what have OCLC been doing in this world? We, we, we've, we've taken a new approach. We've been playing with linked data, and I use that word advisedly for a few years. Now we're introducing it into our production environment. And the first move is identify the entities in your data, not the records. Because the records, especially a, a mark record from the library world, has got a bit of a person, a bit of a subject, a bit of a publisher, a bit of the, all slapped into one record. And then the next edition of the same book has got exactly the same data repeated over and over again, very often in strings, rather than uh, referenceable identities that you can look between. And, and then in, in that, the next phase, the first thing you do is model what is of interest to the web because that's where the people you want to gain information from your data are living, they're operating. It's their daily place of existence. Um, it, you know, some of the more ethereal, low-level stuff that's in Mark Records, etc., valuable stuff, very often valuable to librarians to help them run their libraries. The vast majority of this detailed stuff will not attract people to your website. And then 
share that information in the way the web does. So use things like schema.org, use RDFA, use JSON-LD, use the web in that environment. As I say, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, we put linked data into VIA, ISNI, FAST, and published that linked data five, six years ago now, some of it went out there. So those authoritative hubs are identifiable on the web. Um, interestingly, VIAF, a great identifier for people in the library community, has more links to it from outside of the library world than it has from inside the library world. And it's heavily used inside the library world. If a librarian is going to use an identifier to link to something, usually it's VIAF, because it's got a a global reputation uh, managing authority files from some 35 national libraries and others brought it together. So that's, that's where we came up with our experiment in 2012. We learned from that experiment and decided to adopt a new internal data strategy and we had to evangelise it. I had to tramp around the planet and evangelise it to librarians but I, the other half of my time I was inside OCLC, because it's not exactly a small organisation, with significant development streams in there, sharing the way this could change our workflows. Uh, we have uh, a global data architecture group that guide everybody. We don't force people to go down particular lines when they're developing, etc. We don't stifle research, etc. But the, the guidelines were there. Then we started the heavyweight data mining. And... I, I have to give a hat tip to Hadoop here because the effort in mining those resources, we could not have done it without taking on big data technology inside OCLC. The algorithm that does the FERBA uh, algorithm used to take six months on the old Oracle-based systems, which meant there were defects in it. We didn't dare fix because if you got it wrong, and it ran for six months. It takes you another six months to back it out. Not a good idea. 28 hours on Hadoop the first time we ran it. And that gives us the flexibility to be able to do this kind of thing. Uh, and, then, and that led to us releasing WorldCat Works. Uh, so from now on, we're not stopping. We're now starting to integrate these things into applications. The WorldCat Discovery System which is the new version of um, WorldCat Local and one or two other things bolted together. Um, that is now getting works embedded into the discovery interface. That team is now in their development process using it. We're starting to use them at analytics. Works at an analytics level is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Trying to work out how many people borrow a particular title globally is a major challenge when you've got all the different manifestations and additions. If you can aggregate it up to a worker. The API that backs WorldCat Discovery will have linked data in. We can see lots of benefits in cataloging, point and click, click cataloging, things like uh, trying to solve the representative uh, record problem. If you just cluster some manifestations together, which one do you show to represent the work? The wrong one, usually. In, in everybody's eyes. No matter which one you pick, it's the wrong one. But we're also moving on in entities. Uh, the next entity we're working on at the moment is person. We're moving to organisation, event, concept. And it's kind of parallel. It's not one after the other. But they'll come out. Uh, and then beyond then, we envisage that new products and new services will start to emerge when we're building on top of this infrastructure. Uh, and then once we've been around the circle once, we'll go around again and start improving the person, improving the event, improving the concept, continuing the evangelism, continuing to add to the products, and continuing the innovation. So that's kind of what's been going on in this space over the last two or three years. But it's only the beginning. You know, once it's, 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 it's not... It's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning, I think Winston Churchill said once. Uh, and we're definitely nearing the end of the beginning. Once we've got one of every entity out there, we can start rolling this stuff out. Uh, and, and it's very important that we work with people like Schema.org so that our vocabularies can be described. 
And yes, we had an exciting release yesterday, but it's not stopping there. There's lots of other things. But we also recognise that um, schema.org may not have all the vocabulary terms in that we believe we need to describe to our potential users. There will be some library things, and we're working on building on top of schema.org what I would term an icing on the cake vocabulary. So you have schema.org that does 95% of what you want to do, and then we may well introduce a vocabulary on top of that, just to fill in the gaps. And if people use that vocabulary, um, because schema.org is the core, if they describe their resources on their website using it, the search engines will get 95% of the description because they're using the schema.org terms. And the other 5% sprinkled on top will be extra um, library-ish terms and archive-ish terms and, uh, and, and things like that that the, uh, would be there for people more focused on that community to grab. A lot of those I would in intend at the time to propose that they might go into schema.org, but I fully expect some of them are going to be too focused and too detailed for a particular community. And that's the approach we're moving forward. So we'll get rid of that library-ish term and have something sensible and hopefully we will have something very soon to say about that kind of stuff with a little add-on vocabulary uh, and other data sets coming out in that way. Right, I'm finished. I didn't doze up, which is <laughs> <quite cool. laughs> Any questions for Richard? No, there's one over there. Yeah, um, it's funny that you, that you said that um, more people outside of the library community are beginning to use BIAF URIs than inside. And uh, we're one of them. And I have basically a general statement that we're on the brink of a revolution in entities, um, people, and organizations with the SNAC project, which, are you familiar with that? Social networks and archival. Oh, community. yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, another similarly acronym SNAP, which is the Standards for Networking Ancient Prosopographies. And I, I'm really, really, really interested in using these BIAF URIs that we're taking the time to incorporate into our systems and getting works back from WorldCat, getting machine readable data with these BIAF URIs. Mm -hmm. And I think when that's possible, then it will push humanities in, into a new direction. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I mean, um, I keep using the term hubs of authority because it, it kind of means something to the, the non techie librarian -y folks. Uh, and that's what we're starting to see. So, um, BIAF's great uh, if the person's been mentioned in the authority file of a national library, which is. In a book. Um, n not totally in a book, but mostly in a book, yes, you're right. Um, so th there are other identifiers out there. There's ISNI, uh, which is closely associated with um, um, <coughs> the uh, International Standard Name Identifier, got there. Um, but that still doesn't cover everything. We've got ORCID for all the uh, academics and, and their theses and things like that, that's fine. Um, you know, we've got these hubs of authority at the moment. It's a bit confusing. People doesn't know, don't know what to pick. We don't know what to link to. Uh, and that's the people who are working on our personal entity is immediately looking this. I mean, we host this need. We're a partner in VF, um, so we understand a lot of these things. Um, similarly, we subject headings. Uh, and, and topics in a, in a in a linked data world. Why would you point to a top subject heading for William Shakespeare when you can point to William Shakespeare? Uh, and the, there's a, there's an area of confusion in that. And, and, and I kind of predict that subject headings. Uh, a lot of national libraries haven't got the resources to maintain them, especially smaller nations, because they can't keep up. But by pointing to people and organisations and meetings and things like that in other authorities. The need for a thesaurus of labels for subjects will suddenly shrink dramatically and leave the terms that need uh, an official name for it because, you know, happiness or um, uh, American history or something, you, you can't point to one of those. So we do need a thesaurus for those kind of things. 
But I think when, when uh, the VAFs of this world grow up a bit, VAF is getting schema.org in very, very soon, for instance, and we can start identifying how we connect these hubs of authority together. I think those subject term files will shrink. Uh, I mean, I'll probably leave a load of old stuff in there initially, but the maintenance of them will shrink, and then I think they'll become more important in a way. But for the aboutness relationships, they're not the only show in town anymore. We've actually got the real entities for the people and the places, the events and things like that. So it's, we're, we're on a tipping point, you're right, There's, uh, especially in archives, because a lot of this kind of thing will work in archives. But just like the library world have got their own way of doing things, you've got to, the archive world is very similar and overlaps in that area. Are you trying to cross-link with anybody outside of your personal community, such as Wikidata or anybody else? Like you know, I was talking about there'd be major benefits for cataloging, mm -hmm. and you're really focusing on de describing the person, so you would connect him to his works and the subjects he writes about or she writes about. I would equally expect in that environment that you point off to Wikidata or the New York Times or places like that that add value to that description of the person. Not to take away from the um, creative efforts that gone into describing the, the relationships between works and other, but to add value, to add the context to that, that person. And I would imagine that the cataloger of the future who's managing an organisation description may be um, um, pointing to open corporates or somewhere which has got the, the business structure of that organisation as well as the fact that they published a report on this topic that's in this library. So, so let me ask the question in a way. I, I agree with that vision. The question is, does OCLC agree with that vision? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in the tipping point. So up until six months ago, the people that do the cataloging we're just going, yeah, this is linked data stuff, looks interesting, but yeah, we'll carry on managing my records. Now they're interested. Uh, now they're taking notice. Because we're saying we're going to have an entity-based data architecture. So what benefits can we get out of that? And initially, they'll be worrying about managing the entities. That's obvious. But once they've done that, and somebody says, so if I find something in DBpedia, can I use that? as the basis for a person description in my library? And the answer should be, should be yes. It's, you know, it's not going to take six months. It probably won't take five years, though. It's, I can see an evolution happening in this environment. I'm sorry, one more question. Is there any uh, plan to take some of these identifiers and integrate them with Perl? Um, good. At the moment, our identifiers, because it's a, a stable place, are all WorldCat based. If we linked, some of the other stuff we link to is already under Pearl.org, but those are the responsibility of the owners of those vocabularies, if you know what I mean, or the sort of etc. So it's, it's part of the landscape. And I know what you're asking because there's some issues around Pearl.org, etc., but they're ancillary to what we're talking about here. So I want to cut it short, spare you any more questions, although just see if we should buy you a drink here at the, uh, at the bar. Alcohol after no sleep. Go on then. Alcohol? Well, I mean, it depends on how we give you coffee. But, but uh, just, Richard, thanks again. I really appreciate you. As somebody tweeted, you have more energy than, uh, I forget what it was, Neil, as you, as you said, more energy than, uh, at, at jet lag than, than half of us have on a regular basis. Something to that effect. So. Thank you. I don't have anything more to add to, to close except for a huge amount of gratitude to everyone who agreed to, to speak and share their knowledge and expertise today. It was amazing. Uh, for those of you who are just getting into this world, obviously you're not alone. Um, it's incredible how this has grown in the last five years, the global community around it. So I just would urge you to stay involved at uh, lowbam.net or just uh, use the bat signal and use hashtag lowbam on Twitter and, and somebody will say something probably. So thanks again and I'll shoot you an email just to, this is kind of a prototype for us. Imagine if we could run these uh, in eight locations around the United States. We hope to do that in 2015. So we'll maybe shoot a quick survey to you to see what you think we can do to improve that. So, all right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.